I'm going to have a special season of prayer. I would continually, however, like to direct you to the prayer tent for your special intercessory prayer. Leaders of this conference have thought enough and cared enough about you to establish that prayer tent. And I really want you to take advantage of it. Go in. You can spend as much time as you would like beseeching the Lord for all of your needs and all of your cares and those of the people you care about. Also, there is special instruction available. We are finding out that a lot of people really don't know how to pray. Those things are cared for as well in the prayer tent. Now, certainly I understand that you have gained a special respect and trust for my prayers. And I want to say to you that I'm very grateful for that. But I am not the only one here that can pray. I am not the only one here that believes in the delivering power of Almighty God. So I want you to take advantage of it. Some of your prayers shouldn't keep until the evening service. They need immediate attention. And I want you to go and do that. I hope that you will find the comfort from praying that I have found over the years. There's one thing for sure. A loving Savior will hear your prayers. And he will answer. Please be prepared for what his answer is. In my experience, he says yes. He says no. And he says wait a while. The last one is the hardest one for us. Because we're so impatient. But keep trusting. Keep serving. And he will answer your need. Would you bow with me now? Precious Father, we count it a real privilege to come before thy throne of grace in prayer. We come, Lord, not as a mere exercise, but we come because we believe that you can make the difference. We would not weary you, but you have told us that as a loving father, you love to hear your children call your name. We would not waste time in prayer if we were not convinced that it gets results. You're so loving and so patient and so kind. Deep in our hearts sometimes, Lord, we wonder why you even look in our direction. We have not, not done much to please you, and certainly we have done many things that if you were not a loving God, it would have turned you from us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for holding the door of mercy open yet a little while longer. Tonight I would particularly ask you to bless the family of Norman King. He is now at rest, having left this life now and waiting. Thank you, Jesus, for the resurrection. He fell asleep believing in you, Lord. He fell asleep trusting you. Oh, God, I'm so thankful tonight that the only sure thing in this world are your promises. You will not disappoint him. But you know how we are, Father. We, we miss our loved ones when they leave us. So I ask you to bear that family up and give them courage. Help them to sustain the same type of faith that Norman had and the trust that he had in you. In this hour of bereavement, I, I know you will bridge that gap between earth and heaven and show them love and tenderness and caring. Lord, you know about Mrs. Pitt, 75 years old. It's fallen, and even now as I speak, She's gone under the knife for a hip operation. Lord, have mercy. We get so anxious, Lord, that if we're not careful, we will direct you and tell you what to do. You know, Lord, I'm tempted to say, go to that hospital and go into that operating room and touch her. <laughs> Lord, that's how we are. But when I pause and reflect, it certainly doesn't take much of a reminder that you don't have to go anywhere. You can think it and it's done. You command and it'll stand fast. So I ask you for mercy for this dear one. Give her a successful operation and good recovery. And we move on, Lord, from a 75-year-old woman to a 17-year-old boy. Tonight, I'm asking you for special mercy for Brendan. Brendan has been seriously ill. I'm not ashamed to ask you for a miracle, Father, because you are the miracle worker. You let us do the common things. You specialize in miracles. I ask you tonight the prayer of faith for a miracle for Brendan. Deep in his faith, deep in his trust in you. If he is under the sound of my voice right now, I would ask you to give him courage, knowing that God has heard and will hear him. 
I found out something, Lord, from reading your word, that more important than physical healing is spiritual healing. Oh, Jesus, I remember when you sat in that house that day with that crowd all about you pressing and the doors were filled and the windows were filled. And those four men come bringing their friend who was sick of the palsy and they couldn't even get near you, Jesus. And I remember what happened. Those, those friends were such good friends that they climbed up on the rooftop and ripped off the roof and with cords let him down and dangled him right before your loving face. I remember what you did, Jesus. That man shook uncontrollably upon that pallet. You forgave his sins. There was murmuring in the house, especially the experts and the high officials of the church. They, they accused you of being a blasphemer, Jesus. And you read their minds, didn't you? And you asked them the question, is it easier for you that I say thy sins be forgiven thee or rise up and walk? And just to show you that I can do it, rise up and walk. Hallelujah. And he rose up and he didn't walk, Lord. He was kind of excited. The Bible says he ran and leaped and praised your name. That's the kind of savior you are. And so I turn these requests now over to you. I know that while you're blessing and while you're healing and while you're bringing miracles, you will not forget. This is Tupao Maro, who's in the Middlemore Intensive Care Unit. Bless her, Lord, and comfort her husband and her children. Give them faith to believe. Now, Father, bless our message tonight. We need you. Open the words of life. Let them flow freely into our hearts. I beg you again to honor this feeble clay with your presence and your inspiration. For I ask it all in the loving name of Jesus. For his sake. Amen. It's good sometime to take a little extra time for prayer, isn't it? I feel good always after I pray. I hope you do. My, that's a beautiful sight out there. I don't know if you're aware of it, but every night this week you fill this big top up. Hey, and let's see, this is a one, two, three, four, five, six bowler. It's a big tent. I don't know how many it seats, Elder. Huh? 1,800? Well, we got more than that in here. Because we're sitting close, aren't we? We're sitting close because we love each other, don't we? Amen. Hey, praise the Lord. You know, and it don't matter any difference who you're sitting next to. Did you notice that? The gospel's just as good. Huh? Yeah. You might be lucky tonight. Be sitting next to a Fijian. Went out of here last night so sick, and Sister Lewis came by and doctored me. Well, you know, it's good to be among the saints that care. Somebody else brought me some hot Milo. Don't drink much Milo in America. That old hot Milo was good last night. Well, I woke up this morning, and the ants were marching away with my tray because I had... <laughs> you got a special brand of ants down here. Oh, but uh, the comfort and the joy was that she cared. And some of my good friends showed up tonight with hot lemonade with honey in it. You're in for it tonight. I've had hot lemonade and honey. <laughs> I've just said those things to let you know how much I appreciate your love and your caring for me. And my pockets are full of pills and all kind of stuff. Y'all are... <laughs> Elder, they're messing with me. I don't want to go home. Jackie wasn't over there on the other side. I'd hang around. But I got to go home to fudge, y'all. Quit messing with me. Fact is, when I talked to her on the phone, she said, don't forget where home is. Praise the Lord. Turn in your Bibles with me, please, to 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. 1 Kings 19. And you know what I like to do? I just like to read a while. That's still okay with you? Good. It's the Word of God. There's nothing better. I'll have a few comments, but they won't even compare to what the Lord's going to say to you right now. Chapter 19, I'm starting with verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also. If I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah. 
and left his servant there. You listening to a scared brother here right now. Amen. This brother is scared out of his wits. Oh, wicked woman who is today the symbol of everything wicked in this world. We say she's a Jezebel. It's got God's man on the run. Hard to believe, isn't it? Verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. Listen to him. And requested for himself that he might die. And said, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life. For I am not better than my father's. Oh, that's a sad, sick old preacher, isn't it? Verse 5, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, <laughs> behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Some kind of preacher. Got up just long enough to eat. Went back to bed. Oh, he's feeling sorry for himself. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat. In other words, that meal lasted him for 40 days and 40 nights until Horeb, the Mount of God. There must have been some supper, what do you say? He had a little marlite there. Huh? Marmite, that's it. Oh, my goodness. He probably had peanut butter and jelly. That's right. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. I want you to watch this preacher. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Listen to his answer to God. And he said, Oh, you see, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Isn't he pitiful? You notice what he said? They seek my life. They. It's just one woman. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in a mantle and went out. And stood in the entering of the cave. And behold there came a voice unto him and said. What doest thou here Elijah? Notice how God's giving him a second chance to answer. You know it would seem to me. That after all that wind and fire and earthquake. I'd have a different answer. I think I'd try pastor to come up with something new for God. Apparently he's not satisfied with my last response. And he asks me again. What are you doing here Walter? I think I'd come up with something new. But not Elijah. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Does this sound familiar? Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets. Sounds like a broken record, doesn't it? With the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be the king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abemeloha, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet. I have let me 7,000 in Israel. God's telling him off now. Shut up, preacher. Shut up, old sad sack. Shut up, feel sorry for yourself. You think you're the only one left? I am God and there's none like me. Listen to me. I've got 7,000 in Israel. 
all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Shut up, preacher. My message tonight, how to conquer discouragement. How to conquer discouragement. Every now and then, God's got to get near us and say, shut up and listen to me. He told Moses that once, didn't he? Moses was just a pleading and a crying, oh, Lord, don't blot this people out. Blot out thy servant. Let them live. And God was so fed up with the children of Israel, he finally told Moses, shut up your face. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Every now and then, he has to just tell us that. He's told me that. It's a very disconcerting thing when God tells you to shut up and listen. But thank God when he does, he's got a message for you. And he had one for Elisha as well. Elijah. I quit. I'm fed up. I can't take it anymore. I think that's what Elijah was saying. You see, nobody seems to care. Everybody is against me. Those words sound familiar, don't they? As a matter of fact, since I've been here on this campus, I've heard those words several times. I've heard them in counseling sessions. I've heard them in the notes you've been writing me. Many of you are just saying, I've had it. I'm checking out. Everybody's against me. Well, I got to tell you something. Not all the discouraged speak of their discouragement. They just reveal it silently in their lifestyle. You know that they're broken and discouraged and ready to give up. Discouragement is found in schools and in government and in offices and in homes and even in churches. Let me read something to you. Can I do that? You're expecting me to anyway. See if I can find this right quick. Oh, man. I got some good ones for you tonight. There are some. This is uh, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, July the 29th, 1909. Okay? There are some in our churches who, if there is discouragement in any line, they're sure to talk about it. This is not the right thing to do. Those who do not work in hopefulness keep themselves under a cloud of doubt. You know this, brother, don't you? It belongs to your church. The enemy is not dead, and the nearer we come to the close of Earth's history, the more vigilant will be his efforts to keep souls in discouragement that the light of heaven may not be revealed in words and acts to bring hope and cheer and courage to others. We must be wide awake and meet the wiles of Satan. We should ever be drawing nearer and nearer to God, for we need increased faith and a firm reliance on the help that God can give. These will make us a help and a blessing to others. That's good in 1996, isn't it? Yes, it is. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we got churches full of folk that want to discourage us. But we also got churches loaded with people who look at the brighter side and know that God is still on his throne. And they're happy to share that. And I'm glad for it. Anywhere you find people, you're going to find discouragement. From the beginning of time, it has been one of Satan's chief and most effective weapons to use against the people of God. First King 19 is encouraging us to conquer our discouragement. The life of Elijah reveals well, at least three things that I want to share with you tonight that we must do to conquer discouragement. I submit to you, number one, we need, first of all, if we're going to conquer discouragement, we need to recognize the causes of discouragement. You see, God in his inspired word reveals the causes of Elijah's discouragement. These causes are the same kind that we face today. James said, Elijah was a man just like us, in James, the fifth chapter, in verse 17. Man, just like us. So he's going to be a good example for the kinds of things that we face. I think, first of all, that Elijah has a physical cause for discouragement. Under a juniper tree, in the wilderness, south of Beersheba, Elijah asked to die. Now, that's some phenomena, isn't it? Because just 24 hours before, he was riding on the high places of the earth. Just 24 hours before, he had the prophets of Baal on the run. Just 24 hours before this moment, Elijah was in great power of God. And he was so confident and had so much faith in the Lord that he was strutting up and down and he was taunting the prophets of Baal. Hey, he says, call your God a little louder. Oh, wait a minute. Let me show it to you. I don't want you to think I'm making this up. Verse 27 of chapter 18. And Elijah, it says it came to pass at noon. 
know, after they've been hooping and hollering and dancing around and cutting themselves with knives and stones, trying to get their God to set that, that altar on fire. You remember this story. And they've done everything they can. And here comes Elijah because they haven't had any results. And in verse 27, he says, and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. And he said, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's talking or he's pursuing. And I looked that up and found out. He said, he's gone to the restroom. You didn't know Elijah said that? He's poking fun. Your God's either talking or he's gone off to the restroom or he's in a journey. Or peradventure, he's asleep and you must be awakened. All a little louder. You can see the confidence of this man. And then later on, look what he says. In verse 36, it's just amazing that he could slip so low in 24 hours. Verse 36, he says, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, he's getting ready to talk to God now. Everybody's watching. Everybody's tuned in. And he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant. And that I have done all these things at thy word. Come on down, Lord, and authenticate my ministry. 24 hours later, he said, they after me. They're trying to kill me. I've been faithful to you, Lord. And I'm the only one left that's still faithful. But a pitiful, pitiful excuse for a servant of God. But you know what? Elijah was a man just like us. And he's walking up and down this campground. Yep, some of you have given up. You're so discouraged with your lot. You're so depressed by your condition that you have already forgotten the marvelous things that God has already done for you. Don't give up. Don't become discouraged. Don't become overconcerned about some insensitive wife or cruel husband. Pray on them. Pray on them. I've been trying in every way that I know how to bring you a message this week that says, turn your troubles over to God. Go to him. Beseech him. He is able. Not only did Elijah have physical causes, like physical exhaustion, the brother was tired, wasn't he? I imagine doing all that preaching on Mount Carmel and all that taunting and all that praying. And then you remember what God did. He honored that prayer, didn't he? That flame came down and licked up. (laughs) Lift up not only the altar, but all the barrels of water and everything else. Set the rocks on fire. That's how thorough God is when he comes to the delivery of his children. So I imagine the old preacher's tired. And he just go. when you're tired, you don't think straight. Amen? That's why I suggested to you last night that we not do any counseling after the service. Because when I get done preaching in the evening, I'm tired. And you're taking a chance to counsel with me. I don't know what I might tell you. Catch me the next day when I'm fresh and I can recommune with God and get, build back some of that energy that he's taken out of me. Amen. You don't know what I'm talking about if you're not a preacher. But not only was there physical exhaustion, but there was physical hunger. Now, you know it's hard to deal with a man when he's hungry. Amen, ladies. Amen. Amen. Or sometimes there's ill health and that will cloud our judgment, won't it? All those things can be causes for discouragement. But there also were some spiritual causes. Physical causes are obviously not the only causes for discouragement. I believe that there was a loss of spiritual perspective. When Elijah requested to die, wasn't he saying, "Uh, Lord, I've lost my spiritual perspective. I don't know what I'm doing out here anymore. And if you lose your perspective and you don't have you don't have any idea what your reason for existence is, you will do something pretty stupid. And so here he is lying out here under a juniper tree. wonder what he expected to get under a juniper tree. Just laid down there. Oh, Lord, come on and take my life. Giving up. Totally. Completely. Listen to this. Share this with you because this is good. In the desert, in loneliness and discouragement, Elijah had said that he had had enough. This is Conflict and Courage. The chapter title is Elijah's Successor, page 223. He had said that he had enough of life and had prayed that he might die. But the Lord in his mercy had not taken him at his word. Hallelujah. Sometimes God has to look past our request. And I'm so thankful that God's word says that the Holy Spirit 
will take our prayers in before the Father. And with moanings that cannot be uttered, he translates your prayer. He said, now, Lord, Father, here's what Walter asked for. But Walter doesn't know much today. Here's what he means. Oh, I thought somebody would say amen to that. Because you prayed a lot of silly prayers. And you better hope that the Lord is translating them. Lord Walter asked for this, but this is what he ought to have. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. She says, the Lord in his mercy had not taken him at his word. He ignored his request to die. Isn't that good? There was yet a great work for Elijah to do. That's what I want you to think about tonight. Don't you check out on me. Don't check out on the Lord. He's got something for you to do yet. You haven't even found out what it is yet. You ready to check out? You don't even know what it is. Some of you ready to go over the hill? Ready to desert? I don't want to go back to my church anymore. Go on back to your church with the fire that the Lord has lit under you at this camp meeting and shake them all up. Come marching in church with a smile on your face. They'll wonder who you are. Go down and for a change, sit on the front pew. Lads the deacon over and get yourself a spot. When the preacher gets up to preach, say amen. <laughs> if he don't run out of that church, you might have a revival in that church. I'm serious. It sounds a little funny, but I'm saying to you, go home different than you came up here. Don't spend all this money. Well, these brethren have put a lot of money in this, and then you made sacrifices to come here, didn't you? And you come all up here and sit up here with itching ears to hear some preaching <laughs> and go home unchanged? What a shame. Go home different and make something happen in your community. Lift the name of Adventism. Make people think about us different than they ever did before because you're out doing something. Ministry, nurture, witnessing. If you ain't going to do nothing, pay your tithe. At least let us do something. <laughs> there was yet a great work for Elijah to do. And when his work was done, he was not to perish in discouragement out there in the desert and solitude. Not for him the descent into the tomb, but the ascent with God's angels to the presence of his glory. When God got done with Elijah, he didn't go down. He went up. All my people used to sing it. They composed that song, you know, out there in a cotton field with a whip on their backs with no hope. They were not discouraged. You know, that's the thing about it. In the United States, we were slaves at one time, but they couldn't stamp us out. We sat in the back of those Anglo churches and heard just enough gospel to know that Jesus saves. We went out in that cotton field and composed us some music so we wouldn't be discouraged. We sang songs like, swing low, sweet chariot. That's Elijah's story, you know. Coming for to carry me home. Oh, I love it when those old folk would get into that verse and say, I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels are coming after me. Coming for the... Oh, uh, can you sing that song? I'm going to give you a chance when this is over. I'll find out if you know it. That's Elijah's song, isn't it? Yes, sir. And, you know... I recognize that a lot of it was code. We used to sing in code in those days. So the boss wouldn't know what we were singing about. He'd ride by on a horse with his whip. We'd say, swing low. He'd get down to the other end of the field and somebody else would strike up a song. Tramping, tramping, trying to make heaven my home. Tramping, tramping, trying to make heaven my home. Somebody down at the other end of the cotton roll would Answer them. Wasn't that a wide river? Just one more river to cross. And the boss said, oh, isn't that nice? All the darkies are singing. God protected us. They didn't have enough sense to know that when we talk about the wide river, that was the Ohio River. <laughs> Just one more river to cross. We'd be in Canada, honey. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. Don't get discouraged. Call on the depths of all that you remember about God's saving grace. Don't get discouraged. Don't ask to die, ask to live. <laughs> Ooh, well, I tell you what, if I survive, I want to go home. And I want the real rewards that God has. But you know what I intend to do in the meantime? I'm going to live this life to the fullest. And if I find anybody that will hold still five seconds, I'm going to tell them about Jesus. But you found that out about me, didn't you? Yeah, you bring me old sad sob stories, I'll give you Jesus, don't I? Yeah, that's the only way I can survive, all that stuff y'all dumping on me. I'd get so discouraged listening to you, I'd just, oh, Lord, just let me die. 
The Lord makes his servants very resilient. I've got every reason to live. And when I hear you, I know that I've got to bring you encouragement and hope. God is not dead. Still on his throne. You ask him to die and he's going to ignore you just like he did Elijah. No, nope, not going to let you die, brother. You're going to have to live this life out and you're going to have to end up witnessing for me. You're going to have to find out what it means to live for Jesus. Don't die for the devil, but live for God. Is that too loud for you? I got more. They seek my life. Elijah didn't even know how silly that sounded to God. Boy, they're looking for me. They're hunting me down. One wicked, corrupt woman. And all she did was send him a message. I'm going to fix you just like you did the prophets of Baal. Because you know, Elijah did get involved in that, didn't he? You know, after they couldn't do anything, he whipped out a sword himself. To show y'all what a massacre is all about. You can get dangerous. The direction from God and the sword in your hand. Amen? Oh, this is mighty stuff here, folks. Not only was there a loss of spiritual perspective, and what I just read from Ellen White will prove to you, he lost his spiritual perspective. He forgot what he was out there for. Not only that, but there was a loss of spiritual freshness. The picture of Elijah on his knees praying for rain on Mount Carmel had changed. That mighty man who prayed and a small cloud was seen off in the distance after a while, just a working itself and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon the rain cut loose, honey. And they tell me, oh, Elijah was so excited that he got his feet in the road and outran the chariots. That's getting excited, isn't it, huh? He was no longer spiritually fresh. Fear had replaced faith and spiritual freshness had become spiritual stagnation. But there's more. Number two reason or way you can conquer discouragement. Not only that you might recognize the causes of discouragement, but that you might understand the consequences for discouragement. There are consequences to pay when you allow discouragement to overtake you. If you want to conquer discouragement, you must do more than just recognize the causes. You must understand what's coming as a result. A, a forsaken purpose. You see, Israel was a nation that was headed back to God. Elijah had had that big show up on Carmel, and it had convinced a lot of people to turn in their lives and start following God again. And it's at this particular time that he gets weak. The people were crying, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But God's man was miles away under a juniper tree begging to die. Revival was happening in the church, and he was all hiding. Because of his discouragement, he had forsaken God's purpose for his life. And there's some negative thinking that is also not only a forsaken purpose, but one of the consequences of this matter of discouragement is negative thinking. You start getting real negative. 150 miles south of the place where he had had victory on Carmel, this discouraged man of God became a negative thinker. Consequently, he visualized himself as the only true follower of the Lord who was left. And that happens to you, folks, when you get off by yourself and close yourself in in four walls and sit there feeling sorry for yourself. And I've told some of you, as I've talked with you this week, if you are that discouraged, get up, get out, and get going. Do something. Volunteer at the nearby hospital. Grab yourself a handful of tracks and go pass them out. You quit being discouraged. Say amen. Thank you. Yeah, I know that's the truth. Get up, get busy, reach out to somebody, and you'll forget about yourself. You'll get your mind off your miserable state. And before you know it, there'll be a spring return to your step, and you'll start living for Jesus again. Now, that's necessary. Get rid of that negative thinking. Don't you hate to be around people who are always negative? The sun is shining. Yeah, but it's going to get hot. That's something? I don't like to hang out with folk like that. The writer of Proverbs said it well, didn't he? I read it to you last night. Proverbs 23 and verse 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You can talk so negative that you'll become negative. Little negative ions given off every time you walk around. Whoa, get away from here. We know people like that, don't we? Number three, you want to conquer discouragement, accept the cure. You know I was going to bring you a cure, didn't you? Yeah, I can't stand up here and beat you up so badly without giving you some hope. In the midst of Elijah's discouragement, God was at work trying to get him to accept his cure. <laughs> the way the Lord always does. He allows discouragement to come, but he always has an effective cure that he wants us to accept. And sometimes God's biggest problem is getting us to see it, to recognize that he's already solved the problem that we have. 
What about God's care? Isn't that part of the cure? He cares for me. He cares for you. Although God didn't approve of Elijah's state of mind, he continued to tenderly reach out to his servant and try to help him. The food that he sent him. And, and, and have you thought about that? That's an extraordinary effort. That God would dispatch an angel all the way from glory just to bring this brother a hot cake and a swig of water. See, sometimes we underestimate the Lord. We think, well, I don't matter that much to him. If he will dispatch an angel to minister to your needs, that sounds to me like a loving, caring God. What do you say? And that's what he did for Elijah. A part of his care was to feed him. The food and the rest and the shelter were wonderful evidence of the loving father's confirming care. How different the outcome might have been had it not been for him who cares. What do you think if God hadn't showed up out there in the desert? Elijah would have got his wish. He might have been strong enough to walk out there, Pastor, but I don't think he was strong enough to get back without eating and getting something to drink. And God ministered to him. Secondly, there is God's, not only his care, but his companionship. It's a marvelous thing. Elijah could command his servant to stay back, but he couldn't get rid of God. And you can't either. I found out something about the Lord. He is not easily discouraged. He pursued me for 20 years, and I don't think I was worth it, but I'm grateful that he thought I was. Chased me for 20 years, and I ran, folks. But his persistence, you can't just toss God off like that. And, and simply because you get discouraged and down in the dumps and depressed does not mean that God's going to end his ministry to you. He's reaching out to you. And one of the most powerful ways he's done it in a long time is he got all y'all to gather up here at the camp meeting. And God looked at this situation, Pastor, and he said, ah, we got a shot at it, angel. Look at how many of them we got gathered together in one spot. Let's go down and minister to them. And he's been feeding you, hasn't he? And he's been giving you water to drink, hasn't he? And he's been lifting your spirits down through the days and night after night. God has been ministering to you and you haven't even noticed it yet, but your discouragement is beginning to dispel. You can't get away from the Lord. Here's what Psalm 139 says. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depth, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. Brother's talking, isn't he? The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. Praise God. The still, small voice of God speaks of continuing companionship. God's going to be there. Finally, there is God's commission. You notice what God did for Elijah? Got him up. Got him busy. He said, listen, on your way home, I want you to stop by and ordain a few men. One of them is going to take your place. But he gave him something to do. He offered a cure to Elijah's troubled soul by saying, go, do something. Go and return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abba-Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Discouragement, you see, can be conquered. And you can do it. You don't need to resign. You just need to be reassigned. God wants to do that for every one of us. What do you say? Let me give you a little encouragement here before I let you go. Listen to this. Listen to this. Ooh, this is so good. Sermons and Talks, Volume 2, page 303. In times of discouragement, there are evil angels by our side. But angels of heaven are also with us. And as soon as we strike a note of praise to God, his angels shed their light about us, and the evil angels are driven back. Oh, y'all the sweetest people. If I'd have said that in my home church, they'd turn over the pews by now. But I understand. That's not your way. You're happy, though, aren't you? Aren't you happy that the evil angels are driven back? I know you are. I can see it in your faces. You're just smiling. You're so grateful to the Lord, and that's all that's necessary. Look, but there's more. Then we find our discouragement giving way to a feeling of hope and courage in the Lord. Shall we not, instead of fretting and complaining, use our voice to praise God? Now you see why I'm always doing that. 
I'm never discouraged. Then we shall see more of his salvation and he will let his rich blessing rest upon us. Got another one. When discouragement comes, remember, the Lord's hosts are back of us. Remember that your strength is not found in the words of discouragement. Remember, remember, listen, remember that heaven is not lessened of its, any of its angels. These angels are just as ready to come to the help of God's people today as in the days of ancient Israel. God will empty heaven if it's necessary to help you. Don't waste any time being down in the dumps. Amen. Well, maybe I got one more for you. You stand one more? Listen to this. She talks about a couple of people that she knows. I really like this one. Manuscript release, volume 12. Ellen White and the Australian Depression of the 1890s. That's getting a little closer to home, isn't it? This depression of finances has brought several families who believe the truth into destitution because of its foreclosures. Brother A was in great discouragement as he looked upon his dependent family. He was in danger of giving up everything. We had a most precious season in prayer and conversing with them. They had not attended meetings for months. The Lord blessed us and comforted the hearts of this dear family. And although they, they live 12 miles from, from Parramatta, is that someplace in Australia still? There you go. From Parramatta. See, I've never been to Australia yet. 12 miles from Parramatta Church and 10 miles from Kellyville Church, of which they are members. They have been out every Sabbath since. And now, listen, instead of talking unbelief and discouragement, they are talking faith and hope and courage. Thank the Lord for this. Oh, man, this stuff excites me. I'm going to tell you. Listen to this. Where is it? I got another. Oh, here it is. I'll close with this. Ellen White's talking about James, her husband. Testimony to the church. My husband has erred in talking out his discouragements and dwelling upon the unpleasant features of his experience. In thus talking, he scatters darkness, but not light. He has at times laid a weight of discouragement upon his brethren, which did not bring him the least help, but only weakened their hands. My husband should make it a rule not to talk unbelief or discouragement or dwell upon his grievances. His brethren generally have loved and pitied him and have excused this in him, knowing the pressure of care and his devotion to the cause of God. Even her husband she said, don't talk discouragement. Discouragement can be a destructive force. Amen. I want to tell you about somebody was, that was discouraged as I close. Nine o'clock. Y'all in a hurry? Okay, hold on just a little bit. It won't take me too long. The story of Shirley. Shirley was discouraged. Her husband had just given her a violent beating with a telephone receiver. Pulled it loose from the phone and with the cord, continued to crack her in the head with it. Shirley knocked her senseless. Head was all swelled up and battered. You add this on top of the fact that she had suffered many indignities growing up. She had suffered sexual abuse. Family members had become so disheartened and discouraged. She'd become a real street woman. She got tough. Her husband, after the beating that he gave her, ran off because Shirley vowed to kill him. And he believed Shirley. She's the kind that could do it. It was the Thanksgiving season in the United States. And I'll never forget that Sabbath morning after Thanksgiving, which always falls on Thursday. I was in my church and I delivered a sermon about discouragement. And I opened the doors of the church and no one took their stand and no one made a move to accept Jesus. So as I normally did, I went to the back door and I stood there to greet my parishioners as they came out. And this strange young woman that I had never seen before stepped up in front of me. She said, I want to be baptized. I said, marvelous. Praise the Lord. I'll get you into my baptismal class right away and we'll start to study. and We'll get you ready. She stepped back from me and looked at me. She said, preacher, I don't want to have to hurt you. I said, I want to be baptized. Now you stood up there and preached today. And you talked all that stuff about hope and help from the Lord. I was sitting at the Thanksgiving table the other day. And on top of everything else that happened to me, my sister just dropped dead. We had her body autopsied and they still don't know what happened to her. Now, if what you say is true, I need to get straight before anything happens to me. Now, you baptized me. I kind of looked around for my deacons, you know. I was a tender young preacher out of the country in Ohio. I wasn't used to the inner city in big Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But I had, this lady had a look in her eye that made me believe her. She might hurt me. I said, all right, uh, what I'd like to do then um, is just talk with you a little bit. She said, listen, don't you have any baptism scheduled? 
You've been talking about it. You invited people to come be baptized. Don't you have any schedule? But it made me know, you know, we do a lot of that, don't we? We talk a lot of baptism. We don't have one schedule. I said, well, I have one scheduled in my other church, but it's way down in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. And it's next Sabbath. That's 53 miles away. She said, how are you going to get down there? I said, I'm going to drive. She said, I'll go with you. I was totally unprepared for this. I never had this kind of thing happen to me before. I had never had anyone come up to me and demand to get into the church. I was used to demanding and pleading and praying and crying and carrying on, hoping they would see that I had something good to offer. Here's a lady saying, if you don't take me in, I'm going to hurt you. Well, I was in shock. First of all, I knew that the Lord might accept her, but the saints wouldn't. You know what I'm saying? Well, this is too quick. And you know what I know? I understand. We get a little shell shock from this. We're so worried that the people we make disciples won't last that we end up not making any disciples. Well, I've been watching y'all. You baptize people as a last resort. When you can't do anything else, you finally let them in the church. Amen? <laughs> I've been watching you. I know, and I know there's a reason for that. You can't just throw the gates open and start baptizing folk wholesale because some of them don't know what they're doing. But I got a little idea that once you get threatened, Maybe you ought to look into the possibility. The next Sabbath morning turned up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was snowing to beat the band. There was snow everywhere. We had eight inches on the ground and four more promise. Well, there's something I've never done, Pastor. I have never in my all my 24 years of ministry, I have never canceled a baptism. I've come close. I had to end up one Thanksgiving baptizing people in the creek because the water pipes were frozen up, couldn't fill the pool. Went out, scraped back the ice. Got in, old C.D. Brooks was standing on the, on the bank watching me. I said, Elder, you want to assist me today? No, that's all right. And that's another whole story. I have to tell you that one sometime. The miracle that the Lord worked while we were in the water. I'll tell you about that another time, okay? Be, got, be back tomorrow. Maybe we'll get it then. Anyway, snow everywhere. And I start over to this lady's house. And I told my wife, I said, now, don't worry. We're going to be off the hook. She's not going to be ready. My own members are not ready this early. She's not going to be ready. Amen. You can't hardly get people out to Sabbath school. That's 930. This was 830. I said, we'll just go by there. We'll toot the horn. She won't be ready. We'll go on to Uniontown and I'm off the hook. I won't have to face anybody, make any excuse about why I baptized this woman who threatened me. So we rolled by the house. My muffler fell off on the way over. Do you have mufflers? Oh, devil's trying to discourage me. He's trying everything he could, you know. And I'm going over there and, and folks, I got it confess this to you now the lord has converted me since but i had a kind of a little prayer in my heart you know lord don't let her be ready <laughs> isn't that sad that i'd be that afraid like elijah lord here they come they're coming to get me and i know those saints were going to get me if i baptize this woman <laughs> rolled up in front of her house and bless your soul she's sitting on the porch in the snow <laughs> this is a serious woman this woman is more serious than a lot of the members that i already have in my church this woman intends to be baptized. I gave her words of hope, and she's telling me now, put up or shut up, preacher. You either mean that message, or you better quit preaching it. Now, you said I could have rescue and restoration, and that the Lord would change my life. Now, you better baptize me. I put her in the car, and she's set up in the back. This woman is a lot younger than me. This is a young woman. She's a big woman. She was a determined woman. We drove down there, and she asked me all about it on the way down. What about this church? You Seventh-day Adventists. Y'all go to church every Saturday? Yep, every Saturday. Why? I said, well, it's the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath? Yeah. I had to tell her what that meant. Okay, she said, that's fine. She said, now, how long are we going to be down here? So we'll be all, all day. All day? Where are we going to eat? I said, well, they have a potluck at the church. Potluck? Yes. How's that going to be? I said, it'll be good. Really? I said, yeah. Now, you won't get any pork. No pork? Nope. Why? Had to tell her that. She said, that's okay. I won't eat no more pork. I was not used to this. I was not used to the Lord sending somebody to me that he had already prepared. She didn't know the truth, but her heart was ready. We went on, on all the way down that 53 miles. She kept asking me questions. And I know the Holy Spirit had to be feeding them to her because she didn't know what to ask. How could she? She just kept feeding her questions and she'd ask me and it forced me to tell her. Doesn't the Lord have to force some of us to witness? You sitting up there looking all holy, you ain't witnessed in a long time. Forgive me, Pastor. I'm going to be better. I'm going to treat you people better than this.
I bet sometimes his flesh crawls. And I brought this guy down here, didn't I? I gave her the whole truth. And the amazing thing was, every doctrinal point I gave her, she said, that's okay, I can do that. You know, I thought the woman would hang up on something. So finally, I knew I had her. I said, you don't know how to keep the Sabbath. She said, I sure don't. Tell me. I said, do you work? Yep. I work at the big Heinz, you know, the catch-up folk in the United States. I work at the big Heinz plant. I said, do you work what days? She said, every day but Sunday. I said, well, you know, we keep the seventh-day Sabbath, the one I explained to you, and it means you can't work. You can't work during those hours. You can't work? Nope. She said, well, they'll fire me. I said, well, they might. Might seek the Lord and maybe he'll work something out for you, but they usually do fire you. I've been fired several times myself. She said, you have? I said, yeah, they can't fire me now because I'm an Adventist preacher. She laughed like you are. She said, no work. She said, well, I guess I'll have to quit. I said, oh, no, don't quit. Don't quit. Let them fire you. Then you can get compensation. And we laughed about that. Went on to the church. She said, I'll quit. That's no problem. Whatever it is going to take to get what you promised, I'll do it. She got down there and li lined up for baptism. My little church had a robe for her. We put the robe on the lady, put the robe on another man. It was, it, folk, it was hilarious. I have never seen a baptism like this one. We had one man that came out of the back room and the, <laughs> the deacons had dressed him and they pulled his robe down over him and his hands were pinned to his side and his, and his sleeves were flapping. He looked like a penguin. He came. <laughs> I said, Lord, please have mercy. This is not the way this baptism is going to go, I hope. But don't you think God must have a sense of humor? He must have. I'm sure he has to laugh at us sometimes. Anyway, let me get on with this and finish so you can go. We, we baptized Shirley. And the next Sabbath, Shirley was back at my church in Pittsburgh, and she had two friends with her. And I opened the door of the church, and they joined. And they said, we need what Shirley's got. Want it right away. I said, no, no, we don't do that. They said, oh, yeah. Yes, you do, because you did it for Shirley. I said, well, why would you want to get in this? They said, listen, simply. We were sitting in the bar where all of us hang out in a tavern. What do you call it here? Saloon? Bar? Tavern? You know what I mean, don't you? Something there beside the spirit. That's, that's what I mean. And they said, Shirley walked in like she always does. But this time she kicked open the door and she said, everybody in here is going to hell if you don't change. <laughs> I said, Shirley, you didn't say that. She said, oh, yes, I did. She said, see, preacher, that's the problem with you. you too nice. You couldn't convert any of my friends. And she was right. I was totally unprepared for her kind of friends. You see, I thought the only people that could come to the Lord were the people that had achieved the level that I thought was right. I didn't know that Jesus works with some folk down here and brings them to the level that they need to be. But they got to start somewhere. Jesus deals with old dope fiends and alcoholics. I thank God he does because he saved my son. In fact, he saved two of my sons. You might hear about that later. Here's Shirley. They said Shirley was still as rough as ever, but her language had changed in a week. She didn't swear. She just threatened us, but she didn't swear. And they said anything that can change her in a week, we want it. Are you listening to me, folks? See, the Lord was converting me in the process. I didn't know it then, but he was. Because I was one of those folks that, hey, you know, please don't get in this church. It's only nice people like me. God had to show me. He's got some folk out there. Listen, when we first got to town, we were having a tent crusade. And the folk had a map laid out, all the territories where they're going to go with the handbills to advertise my meeting. And I noticed one great big street right down through the middle of this terrible district. And nobody was assigned. I said, what is this, Center Avenue? They said, oh, Pastor, that's a bad street. I said, well, me and my wife will take it. Oh, no, Pastor, we don't want you to go on that street. I said, oh, yeah. Somebody's got to go. Anybody live on that street? Oh, yeah, a lot of people live on that street. But you don't want to go there, Pastor. So, well, yeah, we got to go. There's souls there. God wants them. My wife and I lined up that Sabbath afternoon. I gave her an armload of handbills. She went down one side of the street. I went down the other. It started to rain just lightly. This is another story. Have you noticed? I'm sorry. But see, the gospel is so good. And I don't want you to be discouraged after tonight, okay? And so my wife and I stood there in the rain, and we had our little prayer. Lyle, you know how you pray for courage. <laughs> I said, Lord, I want you to give me some of these old scar faces on this street. 
Their teeth are yellow. Their eyes are red. Their hair is matted. Some of them are can candidates for the kingdom. Now, Lord, I can't tell which ones they are. So you got to pick them out. My wife started down one side of the street and I started down the other side. <laughs> and I kept looking over at her every now and then. You know, you want to check on your wife, right? Listen, folk, I came face to face with a lady that was wearing a fishnet dress. No, 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 no. You don't want that. You don't know what that is. Have you ever seen a fishnet? Have you ever seen a dress made out of one? This is my first one, too. And she stepped up and she says, what you selling, baby? I said, dear, I'm not selling. Neither am I buying. <laughs> and I shoved a handbill. In. <laughs> Give me, Lord. I shoved a handbill into her hand and said, we're having a meeting and it opens Sunday night. And I'd like to see you there. And we did this all the way down the street. I guess between those five blocks, I must have had propositions from streetwalkers at least 10 times. And on the other side of the street, my wife was getting the same treatment. But they were taking our handbills. Now, the Christians we ran into, they wouldn't take them. Isn't that amazing? The dregs of society have room for Jesus, but good folks don't. That religion? Nah, I don't want none of that. But the old bleary eyes, they say, yeah, I'll be there. And honey, they were there. We opened the tent meeting that Sunday night. They were there. They were there. They were drunk. They were high on dope. They were reeking, smelly. And I baptized them by droves. We took them through eight weeks of crusade and then put them in the pastor's class. None of them threatened me, so I could put them in the class. We taught them. And our little church went from July the 3rd, the 4th, which is Independence Day in the United States. It went from July the 4th. 49 members to the next April, 150 members. All from the dregs of society. Back to Shirley. You thought I forgot, didn't you? I'm old, but I'm not that bad. They said, that's why we want what she has, because it's made such a change in her life. Now, isn't that what the gospel's about? People seeing such a marked change that they want to follow. Has anybody wanted to follow you lately? Don't answer, just think about it. So I said, well, okay. Guess what happened the next Sabbath? A whole drove of them came in. And I preached, and I made the call, and they all joined. I had 22 members join my church from Shirley's Witness. And I asked her later, I said, now, Shirley, I want to be sure. Did you threaten to kill them or what? You know, did, just wanted to make sure. She says, no, no, Pastor, I've gotten over that. And she started to write beautiful poetry, things about Jesus and her deliverance. And I thought, this is marvelous. How can a person make this kind of a change, just an abrupt change? And that summer, I had a tent crusade. And the two ladies that she brought the, the second week, 22 souls now came as a result of her. The two ladies that came the second week, they were my two Bible workers. These ladies had been walking the street for the devil. They call them street walkers in the United States. What do they call them here? Act the same. Okay, you know what a street walker is then. But it was amazing for me to stand in my pulpit, Lyle, and look out underneath the tent and see out on the street. And there they were doing their old trade, but different. A car would pull up at the stoplight and look in the tent curiously, and they'd knock on the window. And the guy would roll down the window and they'd say, come, hear a man. Isn't that a message? Come, hear a man. And I'd see the car pull off the street and pull into the parking lot, and they'd come in. Some of them staggered in, but they came in. Isn't that marvelous? Now, I know what you're wondering. Did it last? That's the question burning in the heart of every good Adventist right now. How long did they stay around? How long did it take them to apostatize and go back into the world? That fall, Shirley's two friends went off to Oakwood College and studied theology and became professional Bible workers, professional street walkers for the Lord. Shirley lasted in the church about three years, apostatized, went back into the world for six months, and she was back. She said, I was a fool. I got my sense back. I'm back. And she started right in where she left off, giving Bible studies, cajoling and threatening people into the truth. Fifteen years later, this was a discouraged woman. And I'm telling you what can happen when you turn yourself over to Jesus. Fifteen years later, I was standing in the largest church pulpit in the Allegheny West Conference in Cleveland, Ohio. The large Cleveland Glenville Church, 1,500 members. I was preaching there on Sabbath morning and I preached a sermon about discouragement. And redemption and I told Shirley's story and as I made my call that day down out of the balcony tears flowing came Shirley and she ran into my arms she said I didn't know you were still telling that story 
I said, it didn't embarrass you, did it? She said, oh, no. I said, well, turn around here and help me make this call. And Shirley turned around, and the two of us called people to discipleship. And let me tell you, when Shirley started calling, they came out of the pews. She got way more people that day than I did. We had a rejoicing good time. Shirley is still a confirmed Seventh-day Adventist Christian. She was discouraged, but not anymore. Shirley's looking for Jesus to come. Are you? Are you discouraged? Have you given up hope? The Lord wants you to know, just like he told those slaves, there's a better way. I'm on your side. I'm going to help. Just stick with me. One of these days, I'm going to send a chariot to take you home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for Carry me. Now here's the way black people sing it after the pattern of our slave forefathers. It's what we call loud uh, call and response. The leader calls out, I looked over Jordan and what did I see? And all the people join in. Come in for the carry. Oh, a band of angels are coming after me. Come in for the carry. Oh, you sound so good. Amen. Oh, swing oh, Amen. Are you ready? If you get there before I do, Amen. Oh, carry me Tell all of my friends I'm a coming to coming for think after all these years that wouldn't bother me but you sing with such soul look out there and almost imagine your faces are changing everybody's getting a little darker isn't god good isn't he a wonderful savior are you discouraged tonight praise god are you ready to praise him stand on your feet then lyle let's send them home with a banger okay you got something that'll lift them up we're going out of here tonight i've already made my call you didn't know i was making it but i did I want a little more tolerance in your hearts. I want a little more room for the downtrodden and the oppressed. I want you to make room in your churches and in your pews for people who don't look like you and who don't act like you. Jesus still is in a soul-saving business. He can change a man and a woman when you can't do anything. God can make the difference. He can come into your house if you invite him. And he can make the difference there. He can change those who are altogether ugly and make them lovely. Just trust in him. Let's sing it together. Power of your love. Lord, I come to you. With my heart be changed. Renewed. Only from the grave. I come in you. Weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. Oh, because let your love surround me. Amen. I wait. I'll ride on my feet.
after the night we really are going to soar with the eagle you've lifted our discouragement you've given us hope you've shown us the light at the end of the tunnel and that light is jesus lord walk with us now and as we leave this place don't leave our side be with us and encourage us lord we are convinced of the power of your love save to the uttermost as only you can save thank you in the name of the father and of your blessed Son, Jesus, and in the name of the comforting Holy Spirit, we do pray. Let all the people say, Amen, amen and Amen. God bless you. Good night.